proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. These are pretty powerful words and is perhaps the most famous bell inscription in history. This message doesn't just resonate with Americans, however, with all people. Professor Constance Grief is quoted in saying that the bell's mystical appeal is in part like our own democracy. It's fragile and imperfect. It has weathered threats, but it has endured. And weathered threats it has our Liberty Bell has actually had a rather unsettled existence, not just bearing the symbolic weight of our philosophical and constitutional principles, but also as a functioning instrument. It's lost its voice. It, it cannot sing. Its transition into a national icon has, however, uh, solidified its symbolic voice. It means more to us broken than not. But that symbol won't last. One day it will fail us, metaphorically, perhaps, physically, and then what? You see, this little bell here has more in common with that iconic symbol of liberty, with that literal voice, than one might initially expect. In 2011, while on grant research at John Taylor and Company, one of the UK's prevailing bell foundries, I was curious to discover that the workmen had produced some bell from the back room in the foundry as we were preparing to pour two larger bells. Suspended from an nylon strap from the crane above, the apprentice led the bell down the length of the casting hall, striking it with a sledgehammer. It comes from the old guys, I am told. He let the bell sing one last time before it died. The bell was quickly laid down in a sandy grave and bludgeoned apart, each strike causing that lingering sweet note to wail out in agony as it gave way to a series of choked metallic clinks and clangs. My mind couldn't fathom what had just happened. Here before me sat the broken bell shards of a bell that was originally cast by Thomas Lester in 1728, older than my country. And it was that same Mr. Lester that originally cast our Liberty Bell in 1752. As I stood there trying to make sense of everything, the workmen quickly started to load the pieces back into the furnace. They were to be melted down and recast. There was no romance in it. The work carried on as usual. The molds poured and the lads went about their day. I left the foundry stirred and spellbound. Recounting to my mentor what had transpired that day, he offered to provide me a portion of that very metal to cast my own bell for my own project. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. Lester and Pack of London, now Whitechapel Bell Foundry, originally cast the bell in 1752 as a jubilation of William Penn's Charter of Privileges. The bell arrived in Philadelphia to an eager city, and a test stand was raised in order to sound the bell, and to their dismay, cracked when first struck. Some suggested that the bell be sent back to London to be remade. Others believed that it was theirs and theirs alone to truly fix. John Pass and John Stowe asserted themselves as capable to the task and hastened the bell away to the foundry to remake. They concluded, quite incorrectly, that Lester and Pack added far too much tin to the metal, libeled it, or, uh, made it liable to uh, crack as it, as it makes it brittle. They fixed this error by adding a greater percentage of copper, and the second bell was remade. Physically sound, but audibly wide off target, the bell was once again towed back to their foundry under public scrutiny and cast for a third and final time. A successful cast it was, and it existed in the Pennsylvania State House, calling the Pennsylvan Pennsylvania Provincial Assembly in the Continental Congress to session. The accession of George III, even church services and public meetings were all marked by this bell. For about 100 years, from the mid-1700s to the mid-1800s, the Liberty Bell rang for certain national events. George Washington's birthday, election day, the anniversary of our independence. It existed as many other bells of the day did. It actually wasn't even referred to as the Liberty Bell originally, but rather the Pennsylvania State House Bell. Its name only changed when the symbolic attributes of the inscription started to gain public notoriety in the face of civil turbulence and unrest. 
hearings of the Fugitive Slave Act, President Lincoln's ad hoc wake after his death in the assembly room next door, and the World Cotton Centennial Exposition where Jefferson Davis himself gave a speech urging national unity, were all moments in history where this bell gained, uh, further, had further solidified itself as a cultural icon. During World Wars I and II, the bell found action again. Draft, oaths were draft oaths were taken in front of the bell. Its image was used to sell or assist in selling war bonds. It was even considered to be moved to Fort Knox for fear that it would be bombed. D-Day, V-E Day, V-J Day, and countless other moments in the modern era were all mem commemorated by ringing this bell. Then again, during the Cold War, Civil Rights Movement, the Vietnam War, and our bicentennial, the bell was brought forward as a national symbol for our country's greatest hopes and vision of what American liberty truly is. The bell has even found a position of English criticism. We got a lemon, some protesters cried during our bicentennial celebration. Whitechapel Bell Foundry has offered to remake it for us free of charge so long as it is returned to them in its original packaging. <laughs> and that's an offer that still stands today from the London firm. But couched in this British response to the issue is another matter. Remaking icons shouldn't be a dream that exists outside of our grasp, reason, or interest. Why shouldn't we remake it? As Americans, we forged a campanological path on this massive hunk of bronze. As a bell that has had such notoriety in its unsettled form, it actually seems quite natural to remake it. But still, why haven't we? Is it perhaps we don't know how? Have we solidified such a sense of reverence for the icon and that object that it will forever sit as a failure of our craft and civil aspiration? Or maybe it's because we don't know how we would use the bell or what we would ring it for. Perhaps we don't even really believe in that kind of symbolism. I set out to master the craft of traditionally casting bells in order to reintroduce it to the United States. Not so that we may engage in them as objects that are mystical, broken, or lost, but as functioning instruments that act to galvanize us, to wake us up to certain beliefs and ideologies. We display that failure, however, as some sort of symbolic transformation into the abstract or ironic, and why would we not? As a culture that thrives on digital mania, we feel as if we don't need to maintain these obsolete technologies anymore. We celebrate the future and look, and we, celebrate the, we look to the future and celebrate our inventiveness. But despite these newer technologies and higher modes of creative ingenuity, we seem to keep a fascination alive that constantly seeks to understand the past or to solve mysteries to unanswered questions. In 1893, Benjamin Harrison commented on the Liberty Bell as it passed through Indianapolis. This old bell was made in England, but it had to be recast in America before it was attuned to proclaim the right of self-government and the equal rights of men. While I agree with Mr. Harrison's assessment of the symbolic factors which govern the Liberty Bell's national and patriotic significance, I must further the issue to address the gender demographic, which renders his issue point slightly inaccurate. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. All people, all inhabitants. I've been thinking about this, and as I watch the news, I read a paper, and see the events of our day unfold, I can't help but think, gee, equal rights and civil liberty? It still seems like we have a long way to go. We hold our freedom as forward, as a defining characteristic of who we are. We believe in the American dream not wanting to think, in fact, it could quickly turn into a nightmare. We constantly strive to evolve and to grow, to better the lives of people that are oppressed, underprivileged, and prejudiced. We want to believe it. But in our determination, in our dreams, sometimes these concepts rear their ugly horns in the face of reality. Somehow, freedom becomes a tyrant, liberty a bully, and equality a lie. 
So perhaps that symbol has failed us. Perhaps that bell needs to be remade. Because I don't see an icon that works anymore. I see a giant crack that erroneously defines who we are. It's waiting to find its voice again and to communicate a social standard that we ultimately want to believe in. 